First, I'll introduce Dr. Tina Koronek, a family physician in Alberta, director of the Patients Experience Evidence Research, which is PEER team, the director of the Evidence and CPD program at Alberta College of Family Physicians, and a member of the Canadian Task Force on Preventive Health. Our second speaker is Dr. Kimberly Wintemute, a family physician in Ontario and the primary care co-lead of Choosing Wisely Canada. And finally, Dr. Guylaine Theriot, a family physician in Quebec, a member of the Canadian Task Force on Preventative Health, the, all, another, the other family medicine co-lead of Choosing Wisely Canada with Kim, a facilitator for the Practicing Wisely CPD course, and a clinical teacher for medical students and residents at McGill University. Welcome to all three of you and thanks so much for participating today. So as is standard with these webinars, our conflict of interest information will now be posted and I'll ask Brian to bring up the slide. So Tina, can you please review your conflicts of interest? Sure, great, thank you, Alan. It's great to be here. Um, I don't have any uh, financial funding from industry. I uh, I'm the co-director for evidence and continuing professional development with the Alberta College of Family Physicians and have spoken at a number of conferences um, associated with them. Um, and as mentioned, I'm a member of the Canadian Task Force of Preventative uh, Healthcare. Great, Kim, can you do the same? Yeah, so I also don't have any industry sponsorship. I am uh, supported by Choosing Wisely Canada, which is a national campaign funded by Health Canada and supported by the CMA housed uh, within the University of Toronto. And I also am a facilitator and uh, an advisor for the Practicing Wisely course, which is um, run originally through the Ontario College of Family Physicians, and now is uh, nationwide thanks to the College of Family Physicians of Canada. And uh, when I act as a facilitator in that role, I am uh, supported. Great. Uh, we'll just move to the next slide. Uh, Guylaine, can you please review your conflicts of interest? Yes, so I'm a physician in the primary care in Quebec, and I have no uh, uh, financial sponsor. I don't receive any grants or anything. I'm also uh, with Kim, the co-lead for Family Medicine and Choosing Wisely Canada. So in that, when I wear that hat, I am supported by uh, this organization. Um, I work um, at times for Ines Quebec, which is a uh, uh, produce guidelines for family doctors and and I get paid like the the hourly rate that the usual usually doctors are paid for this work and for practicing wisely is the same as Kimberly when I give um, those workshops I receive the support and lastly I'm a member of the Canadian task force where we do guidelines and this is uh, kind of a volunteer work great and I'll just quickly review mine so I've listed my affiliations here in front of you uh, I do work for the College of Family Physicians of Canada as a physician advisor, and I get remunerated for other leadership roles that are listed on this slide. Uh, all of the organizations listed here are not for profit. I have no affiliation and receive no funding from the pharmaceutical industry. Okay, so we're just gonna go over some uh, quick housekeeping issues. So um, our audience today is joining our live webinar from either Facebook or YouTube. In both platforms, you're able to participate by submitting your questions to the panel at any time. And we will be having a Q&A session in the last 15 to 20 minutes from the audience. If you're watching on YouTube, please submit your questions in the chat window and our team will uh, record those. You'll need to be logged into your own Google or YouTube account. And if you can't see the chat window, you might be in full screen mode. If you're on Facebook, um, you have to be logged into your Facebook account to submit questions in the chat window. And for everybody watching this as a live webcast, it is eligible for Main Pro Plus credits, and Brian has put up that slide for us. In order to claim your credit, you need to complete a short registration form or survey. That link will be provided several times during the talk, so please look for it in the chat box. Um, and we ask you to complete that by the end of the day, this Sunday, June 21st, uh, 2020. You have until midnight to submit that for credits. Okay. So before we dive into today's discussion, let's review the learning objectives. And Brian, you can put up that slide, that's great. So after this webinar presentation, the participant will be able to discuss when reflecting on the breadth of family medicine, which elements of day-to-day -day practice have the greatest return for patients, particularly in the context of the pandemic, discuss which clinical care can be prioritized in the ramp up of office practice during the pandemic, particularly around preventative services, 
And finally, describe how we might reshape the periodic health exam to reflect a more evidence-based approach while balancing the realities of billing time, billing and time pressures, patient expectations, and of course, COVID-19. So let's just get right into it. The first question is going to go to Tina. So Tina, as members begin to ramp up their office practice as the COVID-19 pandemic lingers on, how do we balance managing patient need for in-office care versus minimizing the risk of spreading COVID-19? And we've actually created a slide for this that the audience can sort of look at and we'll ask you to comment on as you answer the question. Sure, this is a, it's a question that's filled with a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of uh, uh, considerations when we're discussing this, so I think it's going to be different as you look across the country. A couple of the things that I, I think are, are pretty relevant are one are the local rates of uh, COVID-19 in your community. So that's really, of course, going to affect how you decide um, to move forward. Uh, also, the infection control capacity of your clinic. So what is your access to personal uh, preventative equipment um, and other um, things that you would need to be able to provide a, uh, an appropriate experience for your patients. Um, and then the, your own personal risk, the risk of the clinicians and your staff in your clinic, considering that as you look to that. Uh, I think it's a really interesting opportunity we have to start looking at how do we prioritize the care that we're giving? Um, how do we provide care that has the highest value um, as we're beginning to think about how we move forward with all these different considerations. Okay, that's great. And like I said, um, this slide will be available to the audience after the talk and, and as well as the references uh, behind some of these issues. So question two is actually for all three of our speakers. So I'm gonna ask the question first and then I'll, I'll direct it. So for all three, and, and maybe we'll start with Kim, uh, can you provide us with some clinical examples of what family physicians are typically assessing in their offices these days during the pandemic. So Kim, why don't we start with you? Yeah, of course. So um, I would say um, in large part, acute uh, symptoms that patients have developed uh, that are acute and or persistent that might need to be um, a hands-on examination uh, after having been reviewed over the phone. Uh, then there are patients who have abnormal uh, test results that may have, in fact, preceded the pandemic. So I think, for example, of uh, an abnormal pap test that may need to be uh, followed up, for example, with a repeat. Um, and then there are uh, some um, preventive measures uh, that we should not leave behind. So vaccines, for example, and particular childhood vaccines, we want to keep those on schedule. Um, there is uh, some uh, evidence internationally that um, the pandemic pandemic has led to a delay in vaccination, and that has actually led to uh, outbreaks of certain diseases in different parts of the world. So we really want to avoid that. Uh, prenatal care, of course, uh, still needs to happen. Some of it can be done virtually, um, and uh, but most of it uh, needs to continue in office. Um, and of course, hospital follow-up. So patients who have been recently in hospital who might need, for example, staples or sutures out or uh, you know, complex medical conditions that need to be reassessed within a duration after hospital discharge, those kinds of things. I think, I think most of us have continued to do those kinds of things. Well, that's great advice. Guilain, do you have anything to add to that list? Uh, this was a pretty comprehensive list, but I would say that, uh, at least in my setting, we don't see people without having first talked to them on the phone. Uh, and things that really we cannot manage uh, over the phone, then we'll, we'll have them come in. Uh, could be like abdominal pain or some, some lumps that even with photographs, we cannot get an, uh, an idea of what the lump is. Uh, and like uh, Kim, uh, abdominal pap tests, pregnancies and baby visits, vaccinations, this is something that has been continued all throughout the pandemic. Recently, I'm seeing people sometimes for pain control, like for knee injection, because they've been uh, in pain for a while, so I, I, I do put them in. What we do is we make sure that we space patient in time, so I won't have a schedule as full as usual. I will, you know, put the patient and then the other one will be just 30 minutes later, for example, and I have time to make some phone calls in between. That's great. Tina, any, any last thoughts on, on this particular question? Those are a pretty comprehensive list. Uh, the, the one thing that I had just written down is that we're 
uh, really prioritizing sort of undifferentiated uh, symptomatic presentation. So if patients call with symptoms um, that we're not clear about, then we obviously just have to see them in, in clinic. Um, those are those are one of the biggest uh, groups of patients that we're seeing, which uh, is interesting and, and uh, kind of brings back a good challenge to, to our practice. Okay, that's great. So thanks very much for answering that question. Uh, the next question is uh, is going to start down the path of talking about preventative services, and we're going to start with Guilen. So Guilen, now that we've sort of we've talked about it here, and 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 it's happening in the community that we're we're reopening our offices, we're starting to to consider seeing more people as services ramp up. Where do preventative services actually fit in under the current sort of situation with the pandemic? Well, I think most. Most would agree that preventing services should not be a priority at this moment. Uh, I think dealing, like we just said, dealing with acute symptoms or even dealing with not controlled chronic health problems, they sh that should be much higher in our list of priorities. Um, the problem with prevention and screening is that patients and physicians alike have a tendency to overestimate the benefits of, uh, of screening or prevention and, and underestimate the harms. I would say that many individuals, in fact, don't even think that they are arms in screening, and we know they are. Um, also, when you take into account the absolute benefit of screening compared to the possible benefits of the other inver intervention that we just mentioned, I think it makes people pause. Uh, you reflect on this. Just. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't expect that. Um, but like, for example, the Canadian Task Force, who reviews the, the literature on screening, um, estimates that for mammography screening in the 50 to 69-year-old woman, we would prevent one death for every 1,000 women screened over seven years. And when you say that number, even to physicians, they're a bit taken aback. They're not, they didn't know that it was um, um, this amount of benefit was low, you know, compared to what they thought in their head. So even if that's very hard to compare this with the other um, things that we mentioned, I think we could see that the benefit is probably higher in dealing with acute um, acute problems. I could give an example, like uh, in Quebec right now, there were there has been some papers that saying, oh, we will have an epidemic of cancer because the screening for breast cancer has been, has been stopped for a couple of months. Uh, but truthfully, I'm more afraid for my patients that have symptoms and that are not able to get the care they need. I have in my practice uh, a patient um, uh, with a family history of breast cancer and a breast on her lung that still cannot get the ultrasound she needs. And I cannot believe that we're going to put prevention, screening of breast cancer in front of those patients that have you know, acute problems. So I think we need to reflect about this uh, prevention in, in our practice as a whole, maybe even more now, uh, and, and really consider that or um, um, take into account that prevention not only has benefits, it has harms. Um, and I could discuss about the harms of screening a little bit later if, if, if the questions uh, are about this. No, that's great. And I think we're going to get into some of those conversations as we, as we continue this webinar today. Um, the next question is going to focus on the actual periodic health exam or what some people might refer to as the annual physical. Uh, we're going to start with Tina. Tina, I'm going to ask you a question that's kind of in two parts. Um, so first of all, you know, what do patients want when they book a periodic health exam? Sort of what are they looking for uh, when they come to the office in terms of expectations? And then the second question is, what do doctors think? should be part of that periodic health exam. And is there, can you talk about some of the challenges of meshing those two um, levels of expectation? I think you're muted, Tina. Sorry. What I'm gonna to speak to is some of the evidence that we have uh, around those two questions. And the first is what do patients want? So. Um, 
obviously this isn't representative of all patients, but there are some surveys that have been done primarily out of the United States where uh, a number of, of patients were surveyed and said, number one, do you think that going to have a, a periodic health examination is reasonable? And in those surveys that were done between 60 and 90% of patients said, yeah, absolutely. I think we should have those periodic health exams. Um, and then when they were asked, you know, what type of interventions do you think uh, should be done? And it, it, in most of these surveys, it, they sort of just ran through a screen. Do you think we, you should be counseled on diet and, and exercise? And 90% of people said, yeah, probably we should. What about alcohol and tobacco? Yeah, we probably should be counseled on that. And then what about interventions? So again, um, a number of patients uh, want a, a pap test if that's appropriate for them. So about 80%. If you look at how many patients think their reflexes need to be checked, you know, that was over 90%. Um, and uh, so some of those surveys are from 2002, 2003, they're older, but there was one that was just published earlier this year in 2020, where patients were asked, what maneuvers do you think should be done in a, in a uh, preventative health exam? And on average, they thought there should be at least 12 maneuvers, um, including things like looking in your ears, checking your neck, doing a mouth exam. Um, and they rated their physicians how good they thought their physician was with how many maneuvers their physicians um, performed on average. So it does sort of reflect that idea that a lot of people think that health exams are good and the more that you do, um, the better. And I just wanted to relate that to a survey that was done, this was a number of years ago, asking women about their perceptions of mammography. And in this survey, um, their tendency to overestimate how frequently they would get breast cancer was quite high. So they overestimated about 30 times their risk of getting breast cancer. And they also overestimated the benefit of mammography. So they thought on average, there was about a 50% reduction in breast cancer deaths with mammography. Um, so they would guesstimate that out of a thousand women screened over a certain period of time, 160 would develop breast cancer and 80 would be saved from screening. When in reality, those numbers were about five would develop breast cancer and four would be saved. So there's a lot of education we have to do. But then from the point of physicians, what if physicians think, again, these are surveys um, a little bit older, done primarily out of the United States that show that a number of physicians, about two thirds at least, believe that some sort of preventative health exam is a reasonable thing to do. Um, and if you ask them, uh, what do they think should be included? The numbers are all over, but you still have about a third of physicians saying, uh, yeah, I think doing interventions with such as urinalysis or CBC are reasonable um, in those types of interventions. Um, what's interesting though, is if you look, uh, there was another study that looked at uh, physicians' attitudes over the years, over the last couple of decades. And over that time period, we do see a reduction uh, in their desire to do those types of interventions that don't really have good evidence, like CBCs and your analysis and things like that. And so I don't know for sure, but my hypothesis is perhaps that's because we're looking at this now from an evidence point of view and looking at what is the benefit of what we're doing. No, that's, that's excellent. And uh, one quick follow-up question, because it sounds like based on what you just talked about, that there are limits to the periodic health exam. Um, are there any other limitations to that exam that you might want to highlight uh, with regards to either certain tests or, like I said, patients coming in asking they want this test. Like, are there are there certain limitations we should be aware about in terms of the uh, the periodic health exam? Um, well, the one thing I would say, if if we look at the evidence around the periodic health exam, there is um, there are some randomized controlled trials that have looked at this. So they randomized patients to uh, health checks, which in, include. Uh, assessment of a, at least a couple of different systems um, versus no health intervention. And in 2012, a systematic review was published on this in Cochrane, and it got a lot of attention. It was republished in the BMJ. And it essentially said that the health checks made no difference in mortality, cardiovascular mortality. The um, For clinicians who do it, the, the outcomes were somewhat shocking and, and uh, discouraging because it, it really showed that the there was no benefit. And actually that review was updated in 2019. There's a Cochrane systematic review um, of 17 randomized controlled trials, I believe, that shows the, the relative risk for mortality with physical exam was one. So one is essentially no difference. 
Um, now, there are certainly a lot of limitations with that evidence, um, and it's hard to reconcile because someone will say, I do know there's evidence that if I find someone with elevated blood pressure and I treat them, I can improve outcomes. So how is it that we have this other body of evidence that says there's no overall benefit? And so trying to reconcile those two and the types of health checks in these trials were all different. The ages of people included were different. And there was some contamination. So people randomized to have a health check, maybe didn't get it. And those randomized to not get it might have accessed it through another manner. Um, but overall, it's not particularly strong evidence um, suggesting a huge benefit of like an annual type of health check. Okay. And, and just exploring this a little further, I, I, my next question is for Kim. So Kim, primary care co-lead along with Guillen for Choosing Wisely Canada, very important advocate for low value testing and treatment. So as we, as we sort of talk about the periodic health exam or the annual physical, what are the consequences of spending time on, on what we would consider low value interventions? You know, like batteries of tests that really don't relate to the overall risk profile of a patient. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is really important. Um, and certainly there are um, opportunity costs. Um, and then there are also harms of um, excessive screening. Um, and the costs and the harms can be thought of in terms of uh, costs and harms to uh, patients, to providers, to um, the healthcare system, and uh, and perhaps even to society um, as a whole. So, um, in terms of patients, um, so patients uh, often spend time away from work, uh, family, leisure time to you know get um, tests done, um, and sometimes doing tests can uh, make people feel as if something may be wrong, and they can increase patient anxiety. We also know that some patients have significant anxiety around health issues. And, um, and while it seems kind of tempting to order batteries of tests for those patients to kind of reassure them, we also know that um, where people have anxiety around health issues, it's a little bit like a box of Kleenex. So you remove one and there's always another one underneath. Um, and uh, so the anxiety will um, shift to a different issue. Um, and so addressing the anxiety as a whole would be, um, you know, probably more beneficial in the long run. On the flip side, patients can sometimes also be falsely reassured by normal results. So, um, so if we take a mammogram, as an example, um, you know, a negative mammogram today means that they're not seeing evidence of breast cancer today. But uh, that doesn't have uh, any implications for what might be found three months from now or six months from now or nine months from now. And clearly we can't uh, be screening people at really frequent um, intervals. So sometimes we get false reassurance from uh, normal test results. In terms of um, in terms of family doctors and nurse practitioners as primary care providers, um, we have, you know, our professional time is uh, precious and the way that patients can access us or not access not access us is really important. And so if we spend a lot of our time, um, you know, reviewing panels of results um, that don't actually add value to patient care, uh, we're just whittling away that time that um, we could otherwise be making available to patients uh, who really do need to draw on our professional expertise. And so we would be negatively impacting access to care, for example. So that's very important. Um, you know, the other the other thing is, um, you know, kind of thinking about uh, joy of work and how we find joy of work. Uh, you know, I don't know if anyone's ever covered someone else's practice, you know, where that person might, for example, order a lot more tests than you normally order. Um, it's, it's exhausting to uh, to go through reams and reams of results. And um, and and I would wonder if it is something that uh, could potentially contribute to physician burnout, um, you know. Also, um, in reviewing a lot of results, we're perhaps 
detracting from otherwise valuable time that might be spent counseling patients on things uh, that might make more of a difference to uh, to their longevity, to their quality of life. So for example, um, exercise, um, healthy diet, uh, smoking cessation, those kinds of things, uh, which might make more of an impact for patients. On a system level, um, you know, naturally there there's financial cost, um, and uh, particularly during COVID now, um, you know, when we think about uh, costs of healthcare, you know, we often think of the amount spent on healthcare, um, you know, over the amount uh, over a country's GDP, for example, and and we know right now that uh, for most countries, including our own, GDPs will be shrinking. And uh, there's a possibility that that numerator, the amount spent on health, could uh, could really kind of explode. Um, and so I think right now, um, you know, where we can have a hand in resource stewardship, uh, this is a really important time to make sure that everything we're doing has uh, has high value and really offers um, a difference to our patients. And and finally, you know, even on a societal and global level. Um, there are costs to unnecessary health care and, and uh, you know, the Lancet has been uh, a leader uh, around uh, global health um, and uh, planetary health and points out that if health care, if the health care industry was actually a country, uh, it would be the fifth largest emitter of greenhouse gases. Uh, and that, that is really concerning. And, you know, we know the health effects of um, greenhouse gas emissions and climate change. And to think that, uh, you know, we are the ones that, you know, kind of need to deal with the health effects, but ironically, we're contributing to the problem. So that's that's another way. And, you know, right now, Canada Health Info Way and the S Center for Sustainable Health Systems at the University of Toronto, you know, have been working uh, together and on a recent uh, webinar um, that they provided, uh, they pointed out in their evaluation of virtual care that a patient uh, really only needs to drive a car 3.5 kilometers to get healthcare. Um, and at that very uh, small uh, amount of uh, driving, so anything 3.5 kilometers or farther, we see a benefit to virtual care in terms of uh, greenhouse gas emissions and environmental footprint. So all of these uh, are reasons that, uh, that we should really be mindful of, um, of the value of the care that we provide. No, that's great. And lots of information to think about. And, and maybe we'll try to summarize some of that answer for our audience afterwards so they can they can have more time to review and digest it. Um, Guilain, back to you. So, you know, considering that we just went over some of the evidence behind prevention, some of the consequences of, you know, ordering tests that may have low value, can you give some practical advice on how we should be integrating preventative care interventions that have higher value uh, into our office practices? Well, I guess this will really depends on your practice and uh, there could be many models to do that. It doesn't have to rely only on the physician. It could re it could rely on a, a partnership with a nurse or a nurse practitioner. I think there are just a few uh, recommendations and screening that are truly strong recommendations. And if you look at those like blood pressure, uh, colon cancer screening, uh, cervical cancer screening after 30 years of age, uh, it's not so hard to get um, um, the possibility to have a good, um, uh, to manage these into a practice. If it relies only on you, then you need a system to follow this, or you only need to make sure that every time you talk to a patient, you have this somewhere uh, easy to look at to make sure that everything is uh, on track for that patient. But there are not so many um, recommendations that are strongly uh, advised from the task force. Um, there are different kinds of uh, sheets or lists that you can use. Um, I know the, the college has one list. Uh, uh, I produce one list here in Quebec. Uh, so there's many tools that you can use to help yourself and many things that are coming down to fight to help you integrate them into your Yeah. So oh, sorry. Really have a critical look at all the, the recommendations and you will see that there's not so much
Yogi Land. Yeah. And um, if they are, then you need to have some time to have shared decision making, like for pornography screening for women. Uh, it's a conditional recommendation based on shared uh, decision making. Um, so you, you need to integrate that into your pathway. No, that's great. And I think, you know, it's a good reminder, and, and we can probably post this in the chat box, that the Canadian Task Force on Preventative Health has a lot of great resources that patients and providers can look at. They've done a great job trying to simplify things to explain it to people in terms of, you know, the expectation of some of these tests. And Choosing Wisely as well has a lot of recommendations on their website. They've also had some campaigns on this, and I would encourage the audience to check out those websites on a frequent basis. They're always being updated. A lot of useful information there, and, and for providers, uh, it can really help you in some of these discussions. Um, Tina, just a quick follow-up to the question I asked Ghislaine. Um, you know, some people advocate that we should be just integrating, you know, preventative health issues in other appointments. So, you know, somebody calls in with an acute issue, their knee hurts, and while they're in the office, try to fit in preventative uh, health care issues. Is that practical, just given our busy schedules? <laughs> Uh, I, it feels like a bit of a loaded question, but I would I would say um, it's not always practical, especially if you're in a fee for service uh, setting. Um, depending on the payment model that you have, if you have, and we we've talked about this a lot, and and um, one the importance of doing screening interventions that have good evidence of benefit. Um, so like you mentioned, the task force has looked at some interventions that, um, you know, uh, checking the blood pressure is a very good uh, uh, example of something that we probably should do. So there certainly are preventative interventions we should be looking at, um, but we should be prioritizing those that have the best evidence of benefit. Can we fit them into a visit where someone's presenting with uh, a low mood or a broken ankle? It might not always happen. And, and actually, I mean, I've, I myself have had occasions where I'm dealing with other complex health issues in a patient who sees me frequently, but I have somehow forgotten to incorporate these other preventative uh, maneuvers. So it is, it certainly is a bit of a balance to, and it, it may not be an unreasonable idea. Um, one thing I've thought about is if you, if you spoke with your patient, depending on the patient in front of you, of course, they're uh, depending on their own personal history, if they've had cancer or some other problem on their own family history, the frequency which with you would need to interact with them and you would need to incorporate some of these maneuvers is going to be different. So you need to have that conversation with them. And then that needs to be a priority. And that may be a visit on its own, um, not necessarily every year. It may be for some interventions every three, five years. Um, uh, but it's going to be different depending on, on where you work and what type of services you have with you. No, that's great advice. Um, and it, it definitely isn't a simple answer. Uh, but thank you for, for, for taking the time to answer that question. Kim, I'm going to go back to you. You know, Tina mentioned the billing issue, and, and I'm just wondering if you can comment. Do you think, you know, in certain provinces, uh, remuneration for what we call the periodic health exam uh, differs? Some patients can bill fee for service, other, other pa some patients, some providers can bill fee for service, others are in capitated models. I'm just wondering, do you think that that has an impact on the decision as to whether providers want to? continue to hold on to the traditional periodic health exam or annual physical that we're talking about? Uh, for sure. I think that uh, that has um, an impact. And I guess there are kind of, um, you know, maybe two potential approaches to that uh, conundrum. So um, one is to try to operate within the system as optimally as possible. And the other would be to try to change the system. So, um, you know, to, to the point of operating optimally within the system, um, you know, if, uh, if you boil your preventive uh, health visit down to its uh, evidence-based component parts, you might be bringing someone in for a blood pressure check, um, a weight, height, and a tetanus shot, uh, for example. Um, so I suppose if your, um, if your uh, fee schedule requires an examination, for example, of multiple body systems, um, you know, a blood pressure could be considered the cardiovascular system, the height and weight could be considered endocrinology or metabolism. Uh, so there you've got a couple. Uh, and, uh, and then there's always, uh, you know, kind of uh, other observations that can be made um, about patients that are kind of uh, quick and important, um, a color, affect, those kinds of things. 
Um, and then, you know, the other point is, can we change the system? And I think it's really important um, that uh, each province and territory, um, their, you know, the ministries of health are, you know, working toward uh, an evidence-informed fee schedule, so uh, so that that is being um, continually updated and uh, and relevant for today. No, that's great. So you know, as we can see, that you know, there are a lot of compl complex factors when we're talking about how to incorporate preventative care into your practice and, and what to incorporate. Uh, I'm going to ask Brian to put up a slide uh, in to sort of preface the next question that I'm actually going to direct at all three of you. Um, and it's a good time for me to pitch one of the sections at the college. So the member interest group section, which we've mentioned uh, on some of these other webinars that we've held, is, is a section at the college that has uh, a bunch of our members with specific clinical interests. And uh, we have an online community platform where they can interact with each other. And for anyone that's interested, please check out the CFPC website and we can, we can get you connected. Um, I posed a question on that community space knowing this webinar was going to come up. And I asked our members you know, what their opinion was about the periodic health exam. And we got a lot of different answers. Um, what I've posted here in front of you are some of the comments that members felt strongly that we have to continue to do. And I'm just, I'm gonna direct it at all three just to comment on some of them because um, some of the things on this list seem to make sense. Uh, they might not necessarily be something we have to tie to the periodic health exam, uh, like medication review, for instance, but I'm wondering, We'll start with Guilen. Guilen, anything on this list that you think um, is something we should emphasize that we do, whether it's an annual physical or on, an, on a regular basis that jumps out at you? Well, what jumps out at me is that the, um, uh, the thinking that I'm covering health issues that are asymptomatic and that you can really change the outcome uh, is still something of concern for many of uh, physicians in Canada. We know that it's basically not ever the case, you know, and we know with good evidence that there are certain strong things, strong evidence that you can do something that will change the outcome, but there are few and far between. Uh, but the rest of, of what's out there makes sense. And if you culturally or in your practice need a time to reflect on medication or dating the chart or looking that everything is planned for that patient, that might be a way to go and then you incorporate the few um, uh, preventive services that you need to do for that patient. But all of this can be included uh, in other visits, but it all depends. Are you paid? Are you set up if you have help in your clinic to make that happen? Uh, Tina, any thoughts on this? Um, I, I would just say, I think these, uh, I mean, a lot of these are valid points that uh, ongoing relationship with patients. And um, the one thing, thing that jumped out at me when I looked at this list was the uh, the health issues that may not be addressed in urgent care visits. Um, uh, sometimes, like if we only see people urgently, we may miss uh, uh, important family histories or things like that, that we would need to take into consideration for sure. Um, but yeah, I certainly share Gillian's uh, comments about, uh, uh, ha we have to be careful um, that we're uh, not spending too much time on um, discussing uh, all sorts of other things with patients when we could be spending time dealing with acute symptomatic patients who who, who, who we can actually help because that's where we're, we're really trained and family physicians are skillful at, at uh, identifying uh, issues with undifferentiated presentations and that's where we can probably make the best bang for our buck. Kim, any other thoughts on this one? Yeah, I would uh, just agree with uh, Tina and Gilan. I think they've covered the points really well. Okay, excellent. Okay, um, we're going to move on to the next question and we're going to go back to Gilan. Gilan, you know, for the audience that doesn't know, you've done a lot of work in the area of antimicrobial stewardship. You've worked on the Choosing Wisely Canada campaign, using antibiotics wisely. Do you feel that the fact that we're doing more virtual care right now during the pandemic is going to result or has resulted in more aggressive inappropriate care, like, for instance, prescribing antibiotics um, unnecessarily? Well, I think 
think the jury is out on this one. Um, I think that uh, probably at the beginning of uh, doing virtual care, nobody was comfortable to do that. So maybe we would cut corners where we wouldn't cut corners usually. Um, but I think the more and more we get comfortable with virtual care, then we can start back uh, to take this into account and to make sure that we don't prescribe antibiotics uh, inappropriately. Um, and there is a campaign, the Choosing Why is the Antibiotic campaign, where we have uh, looked at the, the, the facts about this um, need for prescribing antibiotics, and we realized that there were if I can say three big myths uh, that uh, physicians had. First, they thought that not prescribing antibiotics takes more time than prescribing antibiotics. And actually, they are, there is data on this, and, and actually it takes the same time because it feels like, you know, for not prescribing the antibiotics, you just have to have some time to explain to the patient, uh, you know, their symptoms and how to take care of them. Um, and, and that leads to the myth that, you know, the patient that comes in really wants antibiotics, where this is actually has been studied also. And, and what the patient wants is really a diagnosis and what to do with their symptoms. So these uh, things have to be, um, are not known, are not known uh, by many physicians, because when I do teach physicians about that, they, they're like taken aback to say, oh yeah, it takes the same time and, and that's not what the patient wants. So I think it goes back to creating this relationship with the patient and having the time to talk to the patient. Now, eventually with virtual care, we'll become very good at doing this uh, in, in, and hopefully we can do it in the same manner that we do uh, in, in personal in person's care. There are some things that we do need to see in the office before we do prescribe antibiotics, and we are going to uh, update our toolkit for choosing wisely, um, uh, choosing antibiotic wisely, and we will address the, these uh, these things uh, in, in this uh, update of the of the toolkit. That's great. All right, I, I, my last question before we get into the Q and A is for Kim. Uh, Kim. You know, based again on your work in choosing wisely, and I'm sorry to paint you into that corner, but uh, is there anything else that we haven't talked about that you would recommend not bringing back to the office? You know, as this, as the pandemic rolls on and hopefully we're eventually out of it, is there anything you actually would recommend people to consider not bringing back that we did traditionally before? Well, you know, Alan, I, I think we're, uh, we're all kind of realizing uh, things that um, may not have been as impactful as we thought they were. So one of the things that I might not bring back, I, I might not bring myself back to the office all that often. So, you know, what I'm finding now is that where I used to be in the office, a total of three whole days a week, I'm, you know, I'm now there two half days a week to see the people who actually need to be seen in person. And the rest of the time I'm uh, working from home and it's actually, you know, after the first few weeks where we were kind of figuring things out, um, you know, I feel like now we've reached a bit of a steady state. So I'm wondering if I need to be there as often. Um, and uh, so that's one thing. So less time in the office, perhaps, uh, and more virtual care. And then I think the other thing is for preventive care, um, or the periodic health exam or whatever, you know, whatever we whatever we call it, that, that moment where, um, you know, it's it's my chance to catch up on what's going on with this patient and make sure that I've got a grasp on um, the, the prevention um, and the issues that are salient to that person's care, um, that might in future be done um, partially virtually. Um, so a phone call or a video call in which we review, you know, medications, uh, how are people functioning, um, social history, family history, those kinds of things and any active issues. And then followed by what might actually be quite a brief uh, time in the office um, for, for example, a blood pressure check, maybe a tetanus shot, and maybe a height and weight. And in fact, in primary care teams, which exist in many provinces and territories now, that um, part of the um, 
preventive healthcare service uh, many times could be delivered by a physician assistant um, or a nurse or a um, nurse practitioner. So it can, it can actually be um, a delegated task or um, a shared task. So really, I think this has given us an opportunity to think about the way that we deliver the care. Okay, that's great. So I'm going to jump into the audience Q and A's. My team has sent me a bunch of really good questions. Uh, Gilan, I'm going to start with you. Are there any legal implications of not performing annual physicals or periodic health exams that you're aware of? So I lost your question, but I think you asked about uh, legal implication of not doing a periodic health exam. Is that your question? Yep. Okay, no, I'm not aware of that. Um, what uh, at a certain point, uh, I had um, a friend. I have a friend who's um, a lawyer, and we discussed about you know when we're not doing things for patients, and the the problem is that the error of uh, commission uh, is uh, often seen as a as not an error, uh, and the error of omission is seen as a big error. But in the case of preventive services, you really have to choose what preventive services you want to offer and make sure that people are aware of the pros and cons of preventive services. So I'm not aware of um, a problem with not uh, doing something that is not proven. Um, of course, there are some strong recommendations that you should make sure that you know your patients are aware of. But beside that, in preventive issues, I don't think there is a problem of not doing like I don't know, a rectal exam, for example. There's no data that will prove um, that, that it's uh, helpful for anybody. So there's a lot of things that we are used to do um, that are not simply not proven. So we should just discard them. Uh, Kim, you wanted to comment on this with regards to something in Ontario. Yeah, so um, just to say that one of the other hats that I wear is, a, is um, as a physician assessor and investigator with the College of um, uh, Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario. So I'm very often looking at, you know, what is considered the standard of care. Um, and, and certainly any physician whose practice is reviewed, uh, if it doesn't have annual health exams, that that is not an issue. Uh, what would be an issue is, you know, if a patient was cared for over a 20 year period between the ages of say 50 and 70 and was never offered, for example, colon cancer screening, um, which is one, one of the few forms of screening that has uh, good evidence behind it. Um, so, but however, however that uh, physician wants to organize their care and bring, for example, uh, blood pressure monitoring, um, colorectal cancer screening, pap test screening, however the physician wants to organize that within their practice, it's really up to them as long as those pieces get done. That's great. Tina, the next question from the audience is for you. Uh, a patient calls up that is due for their routine pap test. They, they have no history of abnormal pap tests. Um, how long can you delay, like is there a general advice you can give on how long you can delay that if the volumes in your office just can't accommodate all of the patients that are due for like a routine pap test? Um, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, you know, guidelines say if you have no history of abnormal every three years is a reasonable uh, time to do the pap test. How, how long can you, I mean, that, this wouldn't be an evidence-based answer. It would just be a, a gut answer. I, 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 and I know as we look at screening, guidelines moving forward, that interval may actually extend um, looking at evidence that's, that's coming up. But I, I, I would say you could certainly delay for months uh, without me being primarily concerned. I'm not sure if my other colleagues would have other thoughts on that. But um, those, those, uh, those screening intervals are really just set by what the trials have done in the past. And that's how we choose those intervals. So it's not like they're a magical number um, after which people start developing cancer rapidly. So I, I would I would have fairly wide confidence intervals on on how much I would worry, especially in this type of situation. Uh, Guilain, I think you wanted to comment on this and I think Kim did too. Guilain, go ahead. 
Um, just to say that there are countries, like for example, the Netherlands, that do screen uh, every five years. Uh, they do a pap test every five years, starting at 30 years of age. And they don't have more um, cervical cancer than we do have here in Canada. Okay. Kim, anything else to add? Yeah, um, I think um, to Guylaine's point, I think it's uh, sometimes important for us to take a little bit of an international kind of perspective. We do pap tests in most provinces and territories every three years, but every five years is done elsewhere. Um, and, uh, and I guess the other thing is, uh, you know, thinking about how will we manage the barrage of uh, preventive care services that uh, that patients are going to need and want and expect um, as the uh, pandemic um, epidemiology changes over time. And uh, and certainly today with electronic medical records and uh, the ability to search our practices, uh, we certainly could be uh, creating searches for patients um, where, uh, for example, cervical dysplasia uh, by diagnostic code has been billed, uh, let's say within the last six months or 12 months, you know, we might, we might say, let's have those patients come in first for their pap test. Uh, and then we'll look at who's overdue and we might just for screening. And we might look at those people who, for example, are more than four years since their last screening. We might bring those people in as a priority and then and bring in the people who are kind of three to three and a half years behind. So I think with EMRs, we can uh, we could actually tackle the backlog of preventive services in a really kind of logical um, and ethical way for our patients. That's great. Um, okay, there's another question here. Tina, I, I don't mean to give you all the difficult question. Um, they they want to know, is there evidence that a family physician who practices according to all the evidence-based guidelines will either have a healthier practice or like a higher consumer-rated practice? Like, will patients be happier <laughs> if they do that? Uh, basically, we're just asking, is there any evidence to back that up? Um, well, I, I know the answer to the last part of your question. Um, uh, there is some evidence uh, to suggest uh, the patients are happier the more non-evidence-based practice you have in many ways. Uh, we had uh, Guylaine talking about antibiotic prescribing. So in, in trials looking at that, patients who received antibiotics were generally happier than those who didn't. Um, but the question is, is, is yeah, where does patient satisfaction fit in uh, versus other outcomes? And so that's something we have to talk about. Um, if you followed all the evidence-based recommendations, uh, there the evidence, no, the answer is there's no evidence for that. And um, just a quick note on the, the evidence I presented about uh, physical examinations uh, and how that evidence wasn't, uh, didn't really, wasn't very convincing. I, I said it before, but I just feel like I need to preface it again, that it, it wasn't great evidence to begin with. And you can imagine the trials included in there. Um, some of them are old and looked at screening interventions we don't even do anymore, um, like urinalysis, or they recommended uh, dietary interventions that we now know don't impact your cardiovascular outcome. So it's really hard. We're working with sort of limited evidence uh, to help guide us forward. No, that's great. All right. So time is obviously our enemy and uh, we have a couple of housekeeping things to finish up, but Guylen, can you leave us with, you know, you just put something I think very important in the chat box. Can you maybe leave the audience with, with, with that take home message about the, the importance of these, these types of conversations with patients? Yeah, I think that the take home message that I would leave is that we can do many things for a patient. But I think we have to be aware of the impact of what we offer patient and choose what has more value and certainly discard what has no value. But what I said also is that I think patients are satisfied if we take the time to talk to them, to explain what's happening, and share decision making is something that should be more and more part of your practice for preventive care, but for other care also. And that makes for a totally renewed um, relationship with our patients. And I think that's what's going to bring the satisfaction up and the care and the, um, the health of the patient uh, upward also. Kim, you want to leave us with a sentence or two take home? 
Yeah, I mean, I think we have uh, two uh, really big duties and commitments as family physicians. Uh, one of them is to um, share decision making, and the other is to resource stewardship. And, um, and within shared decision making, I mean, this is really the intersection of evidence informed care and uh, patient values. And that's where uh, the joy of uh, family medicine uh, can really be found. And Tina? Uh, yeah, I would echo what my what my colleagues have said. Um, I think just really important for us to sit down and reevaluate the interventions that we are providing because we don't have time to do every uh, great idea and be really careful to prioritize those with the best outcomes for our own patients. Okay, that's great. So um, we've reached the end of, of our time together. Great discussion. I want to thank th our three speakers, Kim, Guilen, and Tina, uh, for being with us today. Thanks to the audience for tuning in. We hope you found this helpful and informative. Please remember you can claim your main pro plus credits. This is the slide that Brian just put up. So you can answer the online survey and the deadline is on Sunday. And, um, and because this marks the last in our COVID-19 series of webinars, I uh, just wanna say, we hope you'll continue to join us as, return, as we return to our monthly practical talks for family docs. And we have our next talk in July. August and then September. It's switching to Tuesdays instead of Thursdays at noon and we'll make sure we advertise those. Um, and I wanted to pay a special tribute to the awesome planning committee that I work with at the College of Family Physicians of Canada who put these, this series together. And because I don't sing or dance, I decided to write a poem for them instead. So here goes. Our focus began on virtual care with host Jeff Sisler then CEO Francine. To talk about public health, Janice Harvey entered the scene. With his EMCAC, Victor Ng covered emergency and hospital care. For our COVID-19 rapid evidence review, Mike Allen and his peer team were there. I covered issues in long-term care, which has received a lot of attention. For interviewing an international panel, David Ponka deserves special mention. We discussed infection control in the office, the impact on vulnerable patients too, even advice on ramping up clinical services as this pandemic continues to stew. To make all of this happen, there's a lot of work behind the scenes. So the team that was put together had to be nothing short of keen. Thank you to Alan, Sam, Joey, Andre and Guyani too, None of this ever happens if it weren't for all of you. Then there's DJ Brian, who makes StreamYard sing with all the IT expertise he is constantly able to bring. To our members that tuned in live and the thousands who watched the recordings, thank you for your attention and time. We hope you found them rewarding. Stay safe, wash your hands, and keep a six foot distance. I look forward to seeing you all again in person when the pandemic is no longer in existence. I wanna wish you all a great rest of your day and we'll see you soon.